Hello. Hello. Hi, Char. Hello. How are you two? Good. Great. I'm glad great. to hear it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure we've met, Brett. It's great to have you on the call. Where are you based? Um, Rochester, Michigan. Very nice. I'm in a smart zone. Ah, what does that mean? I'm being incubated. Okay. I'm in a business incubator. Nice. Great. Can probably wait just a bit to get started. Have we heard about w3.org at all? Uh, I'm not sure I have. Could you say more? Um, let me just put it in the chat. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, hopefully it helps. And Char, where are you located? I'm located in Denver, Colorado. Oh, nice. I have a business partner in Wyoming. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a beautiful part of the country. Yeah. That's where all the water is, where he is. Ah, uh, yeah, we don't have so much of that here in Denver, unfortunately. Well, New York City can be beautiful. Are you right in the city, Vipin? Yes. Nice. What what part, what city are you in, Vipin? New York, New York City. Oh, you're in New York? Yes. Oh, that's a recent thing, right? No, no, no. I've been living here for 35 years. Oh, I thought one time it was mentioned that you were up early on your time. You and I are in the same, you and I are in the same time zone. Yeah, up early just means four o'clock, six o'clock, whatever. Which borough do you live in? Are you on, in Manhattan? Yes, I'm in Harlem. Mm -hmm. which is upper Manhattan. Very nice. And behind me is a shot from Central Park, which is only about 10, 10 miles from my house. Oh, wow. Hey, that is beautiful. Hi, Sean, no worries. One second, I'm going to pause the recording and then get us that. Anyway, so I am having a problem setting up the live stream. I'm going to let you take it over, Shar, and then I will upload the video to YouTube after the meeting. Okay, great. Wonderful. We'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining the meeting. And it looks like we are recording. Um, welcome to the Hyperledger Identity Special Interest Group call for June 29th. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Shar Howland, a, a co-chair of this group with Vipin um, and Tim, who are on the call. And today on the agenda, we have our regular working group status updates, and then we'll hear a um, we'll hear about the World Economic Forum paper titled "Reimagining Digital ID" from Vipin. So, really looking forward to that. Are we are we writing anything with that paper, Vipin? How do you mean? Um, I mean, are we going to be adding content to the paper or? No, it it's uh, it's been paper? published. Uh, June 2023 is the. Uh, are we going to be writing a white paper here? 
Yeah, I, you know, we had started a white paper a uh, long time ago, but yeah. the, the ecosystem was still developing and it was growing a lot. So at that time, uh, we decided to give it a pause. It was kind of spinning out of control. There was so many different ways in which we could have gone. So uh, I think we probably should uh, refocus on that uh, agenda item uh, later on in the year. Yeah, Dan, uh, the, uh, in the presentation that I'm giving, there will be a link to that particular paper. And Dan, I know your name is on the list of people who contributed to the paper. Dan Backenheimer, who just posted a chat uh, link to the paper. Anyway, uh, I don't want to hold up uh, Shar in her, uh, you know. No worries. Her no worries. Yeah, I, I, we've had a. Our groups have recently merged and transitioned to be a special interest group rather than working groups. Um, so we're more focused on the. Um, community news and and um, presentation aspect of it, but we could absolutely form a task force to work on a white paper. And I think that would be a really useful thing to do. So, but I will um, continue on with the introductions of the call. This is a Linux Foundation call. So we have the antitrust policy uh, written out here that we are following. And then as well, the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, um, which is linked here. Um, if anybody would like to put their name on the attendees list for on the meeting page, that would be wonderful. And now would be a great time if anybody would like to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about um, anything you want to share your your interest in um, in the space. So feel free to grab the mic or raise your hand. <laughs> Go ahead, Brett. Okay, so my name is Brett Carpenter, and I'm the managing partner operator of Cradco, situated in the city of Rochester, Michigan, on the campuses of Oakland University. My focus is to um, have autonomous embedded systems, and the first low-hanging fruit is identity. One of the things that um, our group will be focused on is um, LIDAR and geospatial information and embedding our, um, our proprietary intellectual property in that technology. Great, thank you so much for joining the call. We're, we're glad you're here. Would anybody else like to introduce themselves? Yes. Hi, I'm Alfonso Govela from Hyperledger Latino America a Regional Chapter. I've been part of the ID Working Group for, for a while, and I'm glad to be back here in this new format. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for joining. Right. If anybody else would like to introduce themselves, feel free to jump in. We also have a, a few announcements, upcoming speakers on this call. Um, our next call, we'll have um, Stefan Moy uh, talking about EIDAS 2.0 and the European uh, Wallet Initiative. Um, next call after that will be on um, AI and SSI, and the call after that will be on credential migration and for wallet um, wallets and credential providers. So, lots of lots of interesting topics ahead. Um, Vipin, I I know you sent this link call for papers out um, in our our email thread. Did you want to give a a brief verbal announcement about that as well? Not really. It, it, everything is there. Okay. Uh, so. Great. Yeah. Link. Link is there. We also have um, 
note about the Hyperledger Aries framework JavaScript um, workshop that's happening on July 11th. And here's links to more details and registering another Hyperledger workshop on running Aries in the browser with Hyperledger non-creds on July 18th. Um, there's the link as well to, to join that. So are there any other announcements, introductions, or anything anybody would like to say before we head into the uh, working group updates? All right. So we'll start with, um, for the Hyperledger Indie Contributors Working Group. Um, we met last week. Our, our last call was spent uh, discussing the Indie Summit, which we just wrapped up um, 11 minutes ago. That This was a, a three hour event um, to get everyone involved in Indie together to talk about how they're using Indie, what is the future of Indie, what do we want to add to it and improve about it? How can we increase those development contributions? So full of very, very interesting discussions and important information exchange. So I have, a, excuse me, I have a question about that. So in, um, in a technical um, overview, are we talking about Hyperledger Fabric integrating with Indy? That came up briefly on on the call today. I think the context in which it was talked about is that um, Indy compared with with Hyperledger Fabric is is very much purpose built for identity, and so um, with the way that the among among the people on on the call today, I think that that is the focus. So, um, but I'll, what about, I'll have to. What about Basu? Are we, um, are we interested in integrating Basu with um, Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum? Any of any of those ideas? Um, I, I so I guess the the call mainly focused on Indie as as the the centerpiece. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll yeah, I it's it's a good question though. If, if anybody else on the call knows knows anything about that, um, feel free to jump in. But um, yeah, I'm not too sure on that right at the moment. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, this is Sean from Hyperledger. Basu is an Ethereum client. Um, and in regards to Basu interacting with Fabric, I know there are some folks working on that. You pro the, probably the best place to go would be the uh, Hyperledger Discord. Um, but yeah, I'm on that. As Char just said, the, the, the conversation this morning was specific to Indy. Okay. And um, what are the other options? What does that ecosystem look like? So it was a really great chat. It was recorded, and I believe they're going to post it at some point um, after the recording in codes. Very good. And the only other thing that I could add is, you know, when Indie was developed, um, it was it was all basically all in one, and then they spun off of the wallet and agent components into Aries um, and the. Uh, the crypto components um, uh, were spun off separately. Um, and as was said, the uh, it, it was purpose built for identity, Indy was. And then again, Aries was derived to, um, to better support identity functions. Now folks have built identity systems that use fabric, um, but um, yeah, you kind of have to, you know, twist and turn to, to make it work. Um, anyhow, that's that's the only thing I wanted to add. Right. It, 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 it's it's technical, be... right. Oh, what were you saying? Sorry, sorry, Brett, to interrupt. Oh, no, I'm just saying integrating the, the two together is would be very um, high level. But also well, from an interoperability standpoint, we, you know, the initial vision, and it still is the vision, is decentralized identifiers if you if you decentralized identifier should work for the user, whether I get a did from an Ethereum network or from a fabric network or from an indie network or from checked or somewhere else, those are my dids living in my wallet. I should be able to use them as I see fit. Um, there there are some things like there are some uh, competitors to indie that don't work with like didcom and there are some competitors to indie that don't do certain things, but but overall, the community is working on being, as standards compliant as possible so that we, so that whatever flavor you choose to build on you are not 
locking that user out of an experience or 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 you know those verifiable credentials or that did come moment. And just as just as a point of reference, my, my focus is contracting with the military. So that would have you know many different um, regions. And yeah. so that complexity is something that I'm focused on. Yeah. So the did spec came out of uh, De uh, Department of Homeland Security RFP years ago, um, 2015 or 2016. Um, and also from a .gov perspective, if you want to look at what's what the BC.gov team has been doing, with, not just BC, but the Pan Canadian Trust Framework folks have been doing, it's 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 pretty impressive. Yes, bringing self sovereign identity into that .gov context. Definitely. The Central Bank of Canada is pretty impressive with all of that initiative. Yeah, thanks for thanks for your question on that, Brett. Um, let's see. So in the Aries Working Group, um, they've been meeting every week. Has anybody been able to, to attend any of those recent meetings who would like to give a quick report? So it looks like they've been um, merging in RFC PRs um, as well, talking about marketing mediators and did peer. So lots going on there. How about Aries Bifold? Anybody in this group attend that one? See the notes didn't get into too many um, specifics, but I think they're talking about um, issues, PRs, general updates and, and future planning. For the Aries Cloud Agent Python user group meeting um, met this week. Um, so, so talking about the re release candidates, um, the next release candidate for Akapai release um, 082, as well embedding a non-creds Rust into Akapai, um, talking about the, the Aries mediator service um, in DCO just open sourced. Um, socket doc, which is a really important piece of that. So that's exciting. Um, did peer two and three as well. Um, talking about one of one of the one of the most complicated parts of um, using Akapai is the startup parameters, or that that can be a, a barrier to entry. And so um, an idea about uh, Akapai startup parameters editor. And then as well, merging merging in PRs. Uh, for Aries Framework JavaScript, anybody attend that meeting? So they've been having a lot of discussions about um, relationship to the Open Wallet Foundation, um, Didcom v2 Wallet API as well, revocation documentation. So lots going on there. Um, Hyperledger Ursa, don't expect there to be um, meetings there anymore with the, the end of life status. Um, and then in the Anoncreds, um, Hyperledger Anoncreds working group meeting, anybody attend that one? So they finalized the release for Anoncreds. 010 um, had a report um, from the non-creds workshop mentorship update, um, and then as well talking about the non-cred specification and new revocation approaches. So lots going on in those working groups. Anything else hyperledger related? Anybody want to bring up? Uh, let's see, moving on to the Trust Over IP Foundation. Don't believe um, there's been an all members meeting more recently than, than our last meeting. Um, same with the communications committee, but feel free to uh, jump in if, if I'm wrong about that. In the um, governance stack working group, um, they've been talking about the TOIP glossary workspace. Sounds like this is a document primarily aimed at helping trust registry and trust spanning protocol specs uh, within the technology stack working group. Um, 
and then as well the governance framework demand curves are talking about adoption increasing and and seeing that digital wallets and verified credentials are starting to make some serious progress uh, in the market. Let's see, in the technology stack working group, um, they've got a bunch of task forces here, the technology architecture, trust registry, trust branding protocol, um, ACDC, AI and metaverse, um, and then a new one, credential exchange protocol task force. So um, lots going on in, in each of those. Does anybody have any updates on, on the working group or any of those specific task forces? I have a statement. Go ahead. I think, I, I think um, in regards to metaverse, I think that the model of LIDAR and geospatial engineering and electromagnetic computation is something that should um, you know, be more of a paramount than um, just having, and I'm not trying to speak disparagingly against metaverse, but more like a cartoon. So that's my that's my my contribution of thought is that, you know, instead of having a metaverse, that having LIDAR and geospatial in artificial intelligence would probably be more advantageous to corporations mm -hmm. in the corporate world. Yeah, thank you for, for that point. Um, there's a uh, link here to their their meeting page and um yeah if you want it, to get into contact with them yeah i could add a, a couple bits there so in the last uh aon metaverse we had uh, uh, a guest from um uh, a researcher at, at berkeley and uh he, he was speaking to um the the ability to derive um the primary is and the most accurate um derivation from hand and head movements that are broadcast is um uh is a unique identity so his uh his research showed that he could with a high degree of accuracy uniquely identify the 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 person um based on hand and head movements uh in a in a gallery of uh, 50,000 um, which is is kind of scary because as I learned from the call, um, you know, the avatars are rendered um, on the uh, receiving end, not on uh, not on you know the the user end. You know, so if I'm interacting with six entities on the metaverse, they're getting my basically my raw biometric information. Right, right. And um, and just and just as a just as a blurt. I'm an IBM partner, and we have um, really strict policy against spatial recognition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you said spatial, not facial, right? I um, no facial. Okay. Facial yes, so there's no facial recognition involved. Facial here recognition is prohibited in IBM. It's yeah, yeah. No, I I get that. Um, I remember that. Um, the this is behavioral by me. So. Um, uh, ISO defines biometrics as the automated recognition uh, of individuals using um, biological or behavioral characteristics. Okay. So these are behavioral characteristics. The way I move, um, the yeah, you sure. know, gait recognition is a behavioral. Your keystroke dynamics is a behavior. I, well, I, um, I, just, I just am thinking that I might get in trouble with IBM. So with, with that. I'll I'll reach out to them and see what they say. Is yeah, yeah. Can you provide that link to me? Because I don't think I can get it from where I'm standing. Oh, uh, yeah, well, I, I can. I'll look for it. But as Char said, the uh, the meeting minutes are are in the link, and within the meeting minutes uh, is the um, the link to uh, um, the, uh, the the researchers uh, um, research document. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was interesting. Um, the, then, from that same document, with less precision, he was demonstrating that again, just through hand gestures and 
head movements that were broadcasting all over the freaking place um, oh, in the metaverse. Uh, I call it the mega curse. I'm, I'm not an adopter. Yeah, um, yeah. They also, also can, uh, can glean about two dozen other factors like your age, your sex, um, you know, uh, your ethnicity, uh, you know, now it's less accurate than your identity uh, uniqueness, but he was able to derive um, those factors um, uh, like with 60 or so percent accuracy, according to his study. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. My, my treatment is that this is applicable to, um, you know, to the corporate world in dealing with asset management. And so um, that that's my focus with with this meeting is to um, have more of an, you know, an ID for let's say IBM Maximo to be able to integrate that into um, asset management. So, and I right, just, right. and I just, and I just think that when you have, let's say, a LIDAR or a geospatial, you have something concrete. You know that that building is there because of the satellite telemetry, you know? So it's not something that you could, in a court of law, essentially dispute if, if you're having problems, you know, with asset exchange or transaction. So that's my treatment. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Matthew, just we just had the uh, uh, sorry, just going up the uh, um, the uh, where is it? The credential exchange um, uh, task force. Um, so we're trying to define the different um, it, 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 the, the most used, the most popular um, exchanges, um, uh, what they are, what their pros are, cons are, things like that. So that was in the, uh, uh, the the credential exchange. Where did that go? I didn't see it on the screen. But yeah, yeah okay, there it is. Yeah, um, th th that task force. So that yeah, that kicked off today. Uh, uh, Matthew does a great job. Um, he's got some uh, great slides in there um, uh, with with links. Um, and you know, one of the drivers was um, you know the uh, the, the various uh, Open ID four. Uh, verifiable credential issuance, verifiable presentation, but um, yeah, what? Uh, but all the you know the other ones that are kind of in play again. Where where could they should they be used so that it's um, um, so decision makers could decide what's best used for? I mean, I really think that credentialing is the, is um, the new space economy, but you know, yeah, that's that's my. Um, yeah. Yep. No. Your perception. I that's, uh, it's my perception. Yeah. Probably why we're we're all here. Um, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, what are we doing as far as our architecture? Are we um, are we focused on telecommunications, or we're just focused on, um, you know, Indy and and the program, the the various hyperledger. Um. Well, uh, so, well, so, yeah, so where Char is um, guiding us through is trust over IP. Uh, so now trust over IP's mission is, um, uh, it, it coincides with some of the Hyperledger projects there, but trust over IP is, is really identity focused and, um, um, you know, uh, and it, it's charters basically saying, look, when the internet was established, um, uh, there was no, it, it, it had point to point, you know, I wanted need to get from A to B and, and the networking that's involved to do that is covered, but not the trust. We don't know right. who's, you know, at the other end. So right. trust over IP is the main mission is, well, how do we get trust into that IP stack? Um, and so, yeah, you could go to, yeah, uh, if you haven't trustoverip.org and the the we do have an architecture framework uh i won't dwell on it here but basically it divides it up into uh two halves four layers there's you know the technology stack and you that's why it says 
at the top of the screen here, technology stack working group, where there's technology on one side, governance or human um, on the other side. So in order for all this shit to work, right, we need government, <laughs> we need laws, we need... Yeah, and, well, that's the uh, whole thing. I, I think that's part of the space economy. I mean, that is the new wild frontier. I mean, att yep. attorneys are like, they, I mean, they, they just set up, oh, I, I, I'm having writer's block, but they just set up an oversight committee. But yeah, that's the arena I think that we're in. Yeah. And yeah. if you look at the overall decentralized identity space, uh, Hyperledger hosts code projects like Indy, Aries, and Oncreds. Trust over IP is focused on governance and policy. Um, you've got uh, DIFF, Decentralized Identity Foundation, which is really focused on implementation. And there's a little bit of, uh, I believe they're doing some standards work as well. And mm -hmm. I think we've got a couple more uh, updates to come. And then you've got places like the W3C where standards around decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials are coming out of. Yeah, I put the W. Uh, the, the purpose of this SIG is to be pan identity. It's not just Hyperledger projects. We want to talk about everything that's going on in the ecosystem and Shar and Tim and, and Fippen are doing a great job of programming, bringing folks from the outside, folks who aren't doing things with, with Hyperledger technologies, but to, to share so we can cross-pollinate these ideas and 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 Got you. Thank push, you for defining push that. The, push the ecosystem forward. Yeah, thank you for defining that for me. No worries. Absolutely, thanks for those updates and, and discussion on that. All right, the Utility Foundry Group um, is on hiatus working with the um, Governance Architecture Task Force still, I believe. Uh, the Ecosystem Foundry Group, anybody attend that one at their meeting last week? It's like they've been talking about the Digital Trust Survey, Digital Ecosystem Components and Learning Pathways, AP Cyber Presentation. How about the concepts and terminology working group? Anybody attend that one? So it looks like they're still working on the terminology engine V2, reviewing um, of the new TNO party driven actor model. So any other TOIP announcements or progress updates? All right, moving on to the the DIF, the Decentralized Identity Foundation, uh, did come working group since they meet on the first Monday of every month. Um, we've reported on their recent meetings. Saw so note as well that their next meeting uh, will not be on July 3rd, the first Monday of July, but rather the second Monday of July. Um, the DIF um, did come users group. Um, it looks like in their most recent meeting, they talked about um, uh, demos and protocols, um, socket doc as well, which is, like I mentioned earlier, a, a WebSocket relay service that Indisa recently open sourced. And then as well, did come marketing. Did anybody attend the, the diff interoperability group or the IoT special interest group? Looks like they both had recent um, meetings. There was a, a presentation in the interoperability group on user adoption and interoperability, which looked interesting. Um, any other diff updates? And for the W3C standard, I, as far as I can tell, I, I couldn't find more recent meeting notes from the DID working group and the community credentials group. They've had recent um, traceability call and um, verifiable credentials for education task force. Um, does anybody have other updates for the W3C standard working groups or general working group updates or announcements? All right, with that, I think we can conclude the working group status updates portion of the call. Uh, and I can go ahead and 
turn it over to Vipin for for um, exploration and discussion of the WEF paper. Uh, Vipin, would you like to screen share? Yes. Great. You can see my screen, I hope. Okay. Yes. Looks okay, great. I'm going to go into slideshow mode. So I'm, since I'm working on a, a laptop, I won't be able to see anybody else's comments or anything. Um, so if anybody wants to bring it to my attention, please uh, show up on audio and either question me or tell me some stuff about what's happening. Uh, so this is uh, based on a, uh, well, let's say a rather shallow reading of this uh, paper uh, because we had to scramble to put together this presentation since uh, the person who was supposed to do this uh, today uh, is postponed to later. Uh, and I had also contacted uh, Aidan Slavin, who was the uh, lead author and I know Aiden for a while because uh, I was involved in the ID 2020 discussions. And I also saw in the paper that a lot of uh, input was from the ID 2020 folks. Uh, so I'm familiar with enough of the concepts to be dangerous. Um, so basically it's a, it's a swift pass through this background and summary and uh, for the first time, a world organization, maybe not for the first time, but still, it's quite uh, interesting that they uh, are advocating for decentralized ID. Finally, uh, then of course, they go into the challenges and the barriers to adoption of that decentralized ID. And they come up with some recommendations. And uh, number six, the remarks on the next, on next steps is my, sort of contribution to this, uh, to this um, debate or this trust in getting the, um, getting this uh, decentralized ID into a global arena. Um, so the first thing of course is the ID overview. What is decentralized ID? Uh, barriers to implementation recommendations. Uh, I don't want to uh, dwell on um, this, you know, this, this is the summary from, which I've taken from the paper itself. Uh, but the identity overview is very important, I believe, because here we are focused, very focused on the identity technology. And I think some of the questions that Brett asked, for example, uh, what is the integration between uh, Aries or indie and uh, fabric is relevant because if you're going to put a um, put something out in production in the real world uh, for any purpose, it has to have an identity component, and it's important that identity component uh, is well integrated. Uh, you know, mostly through standards interoperability and other methods with the component itself. And I believe we don't spend enough time on this topic. And that was the focus of the old identity working group, but I am uh, going to uh, bring, you know, bring that perspective in here, uh, not just uh, the raw updates of different identity components and efforts, but having a a much more systemic view of the whole thing. That means how does identity sit in this ecosystem? Why is identity an important foundational uh, concept and something to solve in a foundational way? Uh, so that's, you know, even they say it, but 
one of the UN's um, sustainable development goals. Uh, but unfortunately, it is a, a development goal 16.9, which means it's the ninth uh, subparagraph of the 16th goal when there are 17 goals. But the first goal is, uh, for example, uh, abolish. I mean, there is a timeline to it too, which is uh, basically that it's uh, 2030. Uh, not a, a first goal is abolish poverty, for example, or at least reduce poverty by 50%. And poverty is defined as uh, making less than $1.25 a day, uh, which you know uh, may sound shocking to some of us, but $1.25 goes a long way in certain places. But still, uh, you know, you can go to bed uh, hungry, you may not have a place to sleep, and so on and so forth. But we have shown through the example of uh, India, for example, that, um, you know, although uh, implemented recently, it was started uh, more than uh, 15 years ago, uh, the uh, Aadhaar ID, even though uh, you know there are lots of things to uh, criticize, has resulted in uh, major transformation of even the first SDG, which is reduce poverty by making sure that benefits flow directly to the recipients without uh, the middlemen siphoning off stuff which is, uh, you know, a, a feature um, of uh, distribution in the developing world. Um, then it says 850 million worldwide have no identity, and there is an identity lifecycle, registration, issuance, use, and management. Registration uh, differentiates between two separate types of identity. One is a uh, genesis identity or a very vital identity, which is a government identity. First and foremost is a birth certificate. So uh, of some sort, uh, an acknowledgement that you were born, uh, you are alive, and uh, you are a citizen of country X. Um, 850 million people uh, have no identity, which basically means they don't even have a birth certificate, I believe, uh, you know, that they can access and control. So the, uh, the paper goes into details of the registration, issuance, use, and management, uh, mostly focused on uh, methods and uh, other ideas that we are familiar with in the developing world, but maybe not uh, very widely, uh, you know, if 850 million worldwide have no identity and 1.5 to 2 billion people are starving below $1.25 um, per day, then we can talk all we want around here, but, and even in WEF, which is support, you know, sort of, a, uh, a poster child for the rich people gathering in Davos, but it is a very influential uh, organization. So all the stuff I just talked about. Um, so in order to look at the 16.9 SDG, which is to provide a legal identity, uh, including birth registration by 2020. I think it is a laudable goal, but I don't think it's going to happen uh, because there are real gaps, real problems. Uh, and of course, it's a uh, development goal, not only uh, as a standalone development goal, but it it is all for a purpose to um, be uh, participate in uh, banking, finance, for gender equality, because women uh, are not even recognized as people somewhere in some places, 
uh, migration, labor market opportunities, and so on and so forth. There is a political threat, which is the lack of identity has brought forward in India. I don't know how familiar you are with what's happening in the Northeast. Uh, in Assam, for example, they have uh, required, um, if you cannot prove uh, that you were, you know, you, your father, grandfather, your grandmother, somebody was a citizen of India in 1947, then you're considered not a citizen of India, which is kind of absurd, uh, but that has resulted in the exclusion of a lot of people from, uh, and actually as a political threat in, in terms of deporting them into Bangladesh, somewhere else. And it's also a racial and sort of a religious uh, uh, warfare. So all these are arising out of identity, uh, which we may not be aware of. We are only you know, focused on our problems, but um, these uh, items are very important and it's highlighted to a certain extent in the uh, WEF uh, paper. Um, and of course, you're familiar with this, uh, this system here, folder, uh, okay, so you have the issuer, holder, and verifier triangle. And the verifier does not directly contact the issuer. The issuer issues the credential to the holder, which is anybody having a wallet of some sort uh, that is cryptographically protected and cryptographically can provide, uh, can store cryptographic attestations of the issuance. And then uh, in the presentation part where they yeah. want to rely on a verifier for any for service or uh, for uh, various other uh, uh, for speeding by a police officer, you have to present your driver's license, but the presentation in a decentralized ID case is meant to be only, um, <clears throat> it's selective disclosure. That means you're basically only showing them your name maybe, or you are a holder of a valid driver's license and that you're older than X. Uh, but that's not the case today. They can read a, a lot of things from the driver's license. Then of course, the one, one way street here between the issuer and the verifier, which is basically the verifier with who can uh, look, at the, uh, look at the credential and say, is that a valid credential? By reading uh, the data registry, which uh, in our world is Indy, for example, uh, and the wallet that the holder holds is Aries. Uh, there is um, uh, Didcom going on between various other uh, entities and that wallet or various wallets. Um, we don't even go into the, the details of, you know, having entities other than humans uh, like IOTs or, or companies or anything like that. But so this is the uh, picture from the, uh, from the paper, uh, which is a familiar picture, of course, for us. Um, the challenges uh, they note are that the standards are still uh, under development um, and lacking definition, definitions um, these, these are general statements because even though we know that some of these things are being worked on, they are not uh, accepted uh, globally. Um, and we have uh, listed some of the organizations that we talked about just now, plus uh, some other organizations like the European Union the architectural uh, reference framework and EIDAS, which uh, is going to be uh, 
the topic of next uh, calls presentation by Stefan, who's done a wonderful job of it before because he's part of the working group uh, and uh, actual, he has actually worked on EIDAS, uh, uh, either ARF or the wallet standard or, you know, various aspects. And he's very familiar with uh, these things. So uh, be uh, here next, next call, which is in two weeks for that. Uh, but these are the challenges as per uh, the paper. Uh, and the risks uh, which we dwelled on a little bit, uh, political risk, uh, data exploitation, which we haven't even talked about, which is basically um, using the data collected uh, or either to do advertisement or surveillance or using that data to do political leverage through social media and so on. And then of course, I think the risks of uh, having uh, that data um, somehow because right uh, I'm having a bit of trouble hearing you, Vipin. I think the connection is breaking up a bit. Now, Seem to be a, a what? Hmm, I'm still not able to hear you too much, unless unless it's just me and my connection is bad. Oh, it's breaking up on my end too. Okay. You, you can hear me now, or. Hello. Are you there, Vipin? Oh. Hearing bits and pieces from you, but not not so coherent, unfortunately. Thanks for your note, Alfonso. Great to, great to have you join. Um, we'll see if Vipin is able to rejoin the call and, and maybe the connection will be better when he's back. Thank you, Char. See you, see you in two weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we meet at the same time every two weeks. So looking forward to it. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Brett. Definitely. Thanks, everyone. I'll go ahead and wait to see if Vipin is able to rejoin. I'll try messaging him as well.
Hi, Vipin. Uh, how's the connection now? I um, rejoined with uh, with my phone. Ah. I don't know why it's uh, telling me that I'm in safe driving mode when I'm actually sitting down. Huh. <laughs> but anyway, so Unhelpful. yeah, uh, I mean, the, you know, I, I, I was just going over the paper. Um, I, I'll have to go back to my, I had to reboot my computer. I don't know what, what happened over there, but uh, anyway. Um, uh, how far did you, did, did I succeed in getting, I don't even know. Yeah, I, we, we were, we had, um, started to cover the risks of decentralized identity. Um, but I think that's about when things started to break up and I know we just have a minute or two left in the call. So we might want to, um, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. uh, the paper is, kind of self-explanatory there mm -hmm. were about 12 um, uh, slides in the call uh, in the in the uh, presentation and I was on slide eight mm -hmm. and uh, you know basically there were a bunch of barriers that they noted and technical recommendations but the most important one is the policy recommendations for adoption uh, which uh, WEF is very um, sort of influential with. Uh, that ha happens to be uh, the core of the of the paper, but it's you know basically things like reviewing policy, altering policy, uh, develop uh, enabling regulation, and um, improve uh, privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, this is all applicable to decentralized identity is what they call it, not SSI. Uh, and uh, future forward mechanisms and invest in public policy. Basically invest is a key, uh, is a key recommendation, invest in technology, invest in uh, getting a good policy adoption and invest in um, regulation, invest in uh, training people uh, in this. These are the recommendations. And as I said, my personal comments are, why is this influential? It is extremely influential. And um, because of the WAF, a lot of government officials show up there and, and and there are technological methods for implementation and the technological capability for implementation. Both of these have to be improved and uh, participate in multiple venues, which is what we are doing. Anyway, uh, sorry about that. Next time I'll close everything before I just do this uh, presentation. Maybe uh, I'm running AI in the background. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry you got cut off. Um, I I think it was really useful to to take the time to go over the paper. So thank you. Yeah, and also Aiden uh, Slavin is go going to come back uh, here mm -hmm. uh, later, and he will do a much fuller presentation. And hopefully we can carve out enough time for that for him. Uh, and uh, you know, instead of just running down a list of updates, which which we always do, but. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, I definitely agree. We could um, cut some of that out to leave more time for the presentation, so. All right, so yeah. he'll come back and we have the next three presentations on, on, on yeah. our um, agenda. And uh, thanks for listening and thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Vipin, and thanks, Lynn and Charles, for hanging around. And um, we'll see you, see you all in two weeks. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Bye.